There are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy. There certainly are. Who's to say there aren't funny little leprechauns running about causing havoc and getting up to all kinds of nasty little shenanigans? If there are, and if tonight's story is anything to go by, then I certainly hope I never meet one. Well, it's Friday, it's St. Patrick's Day, so what better time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink? Because now, it's time, my dear friends, to listen. I'm writing this now because I don't know when I'll get another chance. I don't want to tell people face to face because it's humiliating enough for me to know what they think of me because of where I'm going. You see, I'm going to spend the rest of my life in a sterile, cold, and lonely prison cell. Here's what happened. For the last two years, I've had hard times. I've had a shaky employment history. That makes it really hard to get the next job. In turn, that then makes it easy to worry about where the next paycheck is coming from. And that, in turn, makes it very easy to worry about where to find a cardboard box to sleep in. <laughs> if wishes were fishes, there would be no room left in the river. I would wish for so many things in those days. I wished for a stable job. I wished for a cure to my depression that didn't involve me tearing hundreds of dollars from my already meager pay just to pay for placebos and Gandhi-esque absolutes. So, all I've ever gotten from my post-high school life was a lot of holes in my heart and my pockets. Wishes do not come true, or so it seemed. On my pay rate, I couldn't afford any of the luxuries or comforts in which one may forget their sorrows, such as video games, <laughs> friends, Evenings at the local bars diving into local brews. What I could afford to do was walk. I lived on that side of the railroad tracks in town. Just on the edge of the woods. It was a nice time of year. We'd had a lot of rain in the area. And everything was as green as could be. And a cool breeze combated the heat of the afternoon. Like a refreshing drink of ice water. I would walk the nameless paths where, if you wanted to, one could become blissfully lost. There are paths for everyone. The hardcore climber, the lazy looper, the brisk slope. The last one was my favourite. It was enough physical exertion to keep my mind off the pile of horse pies I called in existence, but little enough I could easily make it back to my hovel. Looking back on it now, I must have walked that path a thousand times. It never got old. The air would always taste fresh. The breeze would feel clean. And the sunlight poking through the leaves felt pure. It was a place to cleanse the soul. I knew the place so well. Every log that would offer a place to rest. Every stone. The creek of crystalline water. So... You can imagine my surprise when I noticed just how out of place it all seemed. That one fateful day. I was on another walk. It was about two months ago. I went early in the day, planning to walk further than normal. The one medicine I knew that really worked. I brought a bottle of water, wore my jeans and jacket, and my hat was pulled over my eyes. I felt that the air had a mild bite to it. Fall was coming up quick. As I walked, I thought about how nice it would be to walk this trail in the fall. The aspens turned to gold. Nature truly is wealthy. Nature is generous too. Look at all it shares with us, and how much we take. I was about halfway through my walk, 
and thinking about how I could go blind and still know my way around the trail. When I saw something I must have missed, which I thought was impossible. There were these two boulders that seemed to form a wall in this gorge, like a gate diverting the path elsewhere. It was just a place you'd run into and go another way. But as I rounded the turn, my eyes fell on a little gap in the rocks. It was about two feet tall and maybe two and a half wide. Small, but too large not to notice. I walked up to it and I immediately thought of Alice in Wonderland. The hole that the white rabbit runs into in the beginning. <laughs> Funny. Down the rabbit hole indeed. <sighs> If only I'd known. I was intrigued. This was like being a kid again. The thought of becoming a great explorer. If only in my own mind. I took into account the size of the hole and stooped down to look into it. There was a light at the other end. And the uh, tunnel was only about a dozen feet long. So murmuring, I'm late, I'm late for a very important date. I got on my hands and knees to crawl through. It went easily, and I stood up at the other end, somewhat surprised at what I'd found. There before me was a rocky canyon, only about twenty feet wide, with rich green moss growing everywhere. I was impressed by my discovery and walked into it. It got deeper and twisted like a passageway in the Paris catacombs, but it never went underground. Just when I thought I'd made the greatest discovery ever, I rounded a bend and nearly dropped a brick from my underpants. I'd come into, I, I guess you would call nature's cul-de-sac, a circular pit with a dripping waterfall at the end and a pool in the middle. None of these beauties were what I saw first though, I was riveted on the strangest creature I'd ever seen in my life. It was sitting on a rock slab by the pool, its feet dangling into the cool water. For the tiniest split of a second, I thought it was a human, perhaps a child. But my stare proved me wrong. It did have a vaguely human shape and had a thin build, almost like a stick figure. It had a grey beard that came down to its waist. Its ears were huge, and it had a long nose and fingers like taper candles. The skin was white as wax and wrinkly. The best description would be a mix of a shriveled old man and Pinocchio. It also resembled a human because it wore clothes. They were once green, but so faded it was some drab colour and it had a long, pointed cap on its head, worn and wrinkled, and a cracked black leather belt around a pencil-thin gut. I thought that he, that it, hadn't noticed me, but the moment I tried to freeze in place, it slowly turned its head to face me. That moment was when I was sure it wasn't human, just because of those eyes. They glowed green as poison from under bushy, grey eyebrows, like emeralds in a spotlight. My terror must have looked amusing because, somewhere above that beard, a tiny pair of cracked lips curled into a mischievous grin of pointy, yellow teeth. The grin someone gets when they know something you don't. I heard it speak in a reedy but clear voice. My, my, my. You found me at last. It was still taking all of my concentration not to pee my pants, so I could say nothing. It scratched its chin with its bony fingers and hopped to its feet. Don't worry, boy. Plenty of folks find themselves where you are. I finally gulped down the stone in my throat to utter a question. Where is here? Ah, the downside of the hill of life, of course. Difficulty, problems, in your instance, money. 
that marvellous shiny stuff that causes most, if not all, human problems. Human? Then, what does that make you? I asked sheepishly. The bizarre little thing twirled on its bare feet, its arms spread out like an exuberant girl showing off a new dress. Well, I can tell you, boy, your lads and lasses got the look all wrong. <laughs> Red hair, green jacket with shiny brass buttons, shamrocks and all that rot. The once beloved image of a short, red-haired, jolly little man in green clothes clashed in my mind, and now brought only revulsion, even compared to this ghastly-looking imp. (laughs) A leprechaun! The word sounded ridiculous, even in that moment. The creature clapped its hands excitedly, and jigged about making shrill noises. Oh, penny for the smart one there. Bright little lad, aren't you? Bright as mud. I was not about to be mocked by the Irish version of a jigsaw doll, so I clenched my fist. <laughs> what the hell do you want, you... you... <laughs> ah, you can see it. I've heard it all by now. It is music to my ears. Your long legs are not as good with insults as you used to be. It spoke dreamily, as if not talking to me at all and it stared off into nothing. I was about to speak when it continued in its screechy but dreamy voice. Listen here, spindle sharks. What if I were to tell you that I can fix your woes? Say what? I asked, stupidly. You'd like to be kept off the streets, eating the rats and roaches. You'd like the comfort of a home to the misery of living under a tarp, eh? How would you know that? I felt slightly violated to know that somehow, some way, this odd little creature put me at a disadvantage. That it had been watching me somehow. I wouldn't be here if I didn't. And it doesn't even matter how I know. What matters is I can help you with your problems. I can help you with your finances. I can help you from sleeping with some mangy stray mutt in some alleyway. Now, I don't deny I was tempted, my need for answers dampened by this tantalizing offer. But somehow, that little cricket in my head still remembered that this was all very wrong. (sighs) What is it going to cost me? It gasped dramatically and clasped its bony hands over its chest. Oh dear, my reputation precedes me, the leprechaun leered. It then dropped the theatrics and looked very solemn. Listen, boyo. There is nothing you have that I could possibly want. Not a thing. Even if you are a king, I have it all, and more. All that you need to do is accept. I'd read enough online stories in my spare time to instill some fear in me of these backwater deals. What do you want? Sign my name in blood. Sell you my soul. It comically began slapping its forehead with its palm, rolling its eyes. <sighs> Tis like talking to a bloody rock in here, isn't it? I don't want nothing at all. In fact, you don't even need to do anything, except say yes or no. Once that happens, you'll never even see me again. So I'll ask you again. Do you want to forget your worries about money? Do you want to live in ease? Simply answer me. Yes or no. I don't know how long I stood there, silently thinking. (laughs) It must not have been long enough. No matter what this creature was, I did need money. I did need ease. I needed relief from the hell I'd been living for so long. So, I looked it dead in the eyes and spoke simply, but clearly, the one word that ruined my life. Yes. The withered little leprechaun giggled, clapping its hands again, and the grin on its face stretched even wider. 
Quick as a flash, it lunged within a short range of me, until it was looking up at me from by my feet. It looked even fouler from so close, but when it extended its tapering hand, I shook it without a thought. Its skin was cold and clammy, but the grip was strong as iron. The next thing I knew, I was standing back at the turn in the trail, my back against the stone. The sunlight hurt my eyes as if I'd just come out of the strangest dream in my life. Wishful thinking, looking back on it now. I turned to the rocks, only to find that the hole was gone. I went home immediately, surprisingly refreshed by this break in banality. I went straight to sleep, almost convinced that I'd imagined the whole thing. When I woke up the next day, I thought, perhaps, I was mad. I had little time to think since I had just woken to an alarm. I swung my legs down to head out the door as if all were normal. My foot connected with something and, completely unprepared, I flew sprawling to the floor. Stars filled my vision and I rolled onto my back rubbing my bruised jaw. As I sat up, the curses on my breath froze when I saw what I'd fallen over. A wooden chest the size of a little red wagon was sitting dead center on the rug. It looked very old, the wood starting to warp, the iron bindings rusted, and a creaky padlock securing it shut. Taking a shovel from the nearest neighbor's yard, I broke the lock and opened it to the most jaw-dropping sight I'd ever seen. A sight that now fills me with dread. The box was filled to the rim with gold. Gold coins, gold bullion, gold jewelry. I must have sat there for several minutes, still as stone, before I screamed for joy, dipping my hands into the treasure like life-giving water, flinging it about the place, burying my face in it, being a proper fool. Days later, I'd made plans to start pawning the better stuff for cash. So I started to sort it all out into boxes I'd grabbed from behind the local booth store. I looked and poured each one, thinking of the golden aspens outside and of the path. <laughs> How short-lived joy can be. You see, I'd gone through about two-thirds of the box, having sorted and stored this part of the findings and sold some of them when I came across a gold plate. There was something on it, this brownish stain that looked almost like rust. I wanted it to look nice when I'd sell it, so I made to clean it off when I smelled it. It smelled just like when you have a nosebleed. A sinking feeling told me that I knew what it was. Blood. I looked at some of the other more buried pieces. Some of them had blood on them too, and I was surprised. That's when I found the knife at the bottom. It wasn't made of gold at all. In fact, it was a four-inch switchblade, one that I'd once owned, but had lost several weeks ago. The knife with my fingerprints on the handle, and the blood of three people on the blade. The next day, when I was trying to plan on what to do, a SWAT team kicked down my door and dragged me to jail in handcuffs. It all happened so fast, I said nothing in my own defense. However, in the past few weeks, things have become far too clear. I'd been connected to the murders of three different wealthy people who collected gold items, all of them within my home state. No one had even seen who had broken in and killed them. But the evidence was overwhelming. Each had been stabbed to death. Their stolen gold now had my fingerprints all over it. And it was all too obvious that I had a clear motive. I needed the money. I didn't even try to defend myself. How could I have? The evidence was all against me. <laughs> And what was I going to tell them? What would I say to them? 
about what I had met in that forest. To be honest, I'm going to be in here a long time. And I'd like to keep a shred of my dignity and sanity. I prefer a state prison to a mental institution. I'm writing this with a pen, after all, not a crayon. The law of conversion of mass says that matter cannot be created or destroyed. I realize now that I was a fool. Magic does not exist and never will. Everything has to come from somewhere. I just didn't think of where the gold came from. Or who it had come from. Well, that one was a little bit different from what I would normally do, but I hope you enjoyed it nonetheless. Lots more stories on the channel, so if you're new here, please click on that like button, leave a comment, and I would just love it if you subscribed. Okay, everyone. Be back again soon. Hope you'll join me. Bye for now.